I do have a preacher's voice, but I don't know that I'm going to be able to get it that well. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay, so Doug wants to uh, Doug wants to catch his breath, which is why I'm going first, because I think it would have been nice if he'd gone first, but I'm going to go first. And um, I want to thank you guys for coming out. My name is Leif. I live in the community, and uh, I don't know why I got asked to speak, but I'm going to try to make your time worth it, because you'll never get it back. So as I was walking with you guys, I thought about the fact, listening to the people who were uh, leading the chants. Thank you. But long after we get hoarse, and long after this particular pandemic, social distancing lightens and we go back to our lives, I'm thinking about what we have to do for the long haul. And so what I'm going to say to you today might seem incredibly counterintuitive, so I'm going to ask that you bear with me to the end. Because really what I want to talk about, and I'm really primarily talking to white folks, is compa but to everybody are two words, compassion and tenderness. And um, I say that because I'm looking at the sign that says you are complicit, which means we are complicit, right? So everybody who's got my kind of flesh tone, we feel complicity, right? How does it feel? It's painful, right? It's profoundly painful. And I, I guess what I've been reflecting on in the last few weeks is that that for me, a term like white fragility is actually not useful. There's a sort of pejorative nature to fragility. And I want us all to think about the fact that some of us in this, in this space have been told about other things. You're so sensitive. You're so sensitive. What do you, you get so sensitive about those polar bears on the melting ice. You're so sensitive about people not having health care, right? And we would stand up to that. We would say, wait a minute. It's not that we're too sensitive. It's that we have emotions because we're human and this hurts. And so I want to suggest that instead of throwing around the word fragility and, and instead of trying to sort of outdo ourselves with self-flagellation to see how fast we can all go, I'm the white supremacist. No, I'm a bigger white supremacist. No, I really entitle my white supremacist. To lay all that down. Because I think if we want to do the long work of dismantling white supremacy as white people, first we have to grieve. And absolutely, it's not a comparison. There's not, it doesn't serve us to go, certainly, we know nothing about the terror that people of color, black and brown people, and people, bodies of culture live in, in the society. But in the same way that I would not say to the family that I ministered to who lost a first child to death, and then a second child to death five years later, well, you know, I know families that have lost like nine children in a fire. Who would do that? None of us. So I want to suggest that instead of hunkering down with complicity, well, not with complicity, but with fragility, that we hunker down with our tenderness. And we say, of course, we have great tenderness in our bodies because none of us wanted to be born colluding with oppression. None of us wanted to wake up and say, I can't wait to grow up and be an adult and be the fulfilled manifestation of white supremacy and brutality, right? Who here dreamed of doing that? What men here dreamed of saying, I want to embody misogyny and patriarchy when I grow up? And you do. And I do. And we do. So what I'm suggesting is that if we want to stay in this work for the long haul, that we anchor it in compassion. Self-compassion first. And I just want to say a little bit more and then I'll be quiet. But so a couple of weeks ago, like, I've been standing out on 101 with you guys since we started. And for the last two weeks, I was in Dublin on 101. And I would notice the cars that didn't honk and wave and thumbs up. And people would look straight ahead. They couldn't make eye contact. And I got curious about what is it in their life story that makes it so that it was too hard to meet our eyes. And I started thinking about when in my life have I been unable to look straight on and instead of beating myself up for that and thinking about what a coward I was, I wrapped myself in tenderness that in those moments, that's what I could do with my fear. And from that place of compassion for myself right here in my belly, I could actually start feeling some compassion for the people who aren't here with us, for the white folks who aren't going to say, yes, absolutely, I understand that I'm complicit and I've read everybody's book. I've read the books. I'm hip. I've read the list. I've read White Fragility, I've read How to Be Anti-Racist, I've read Waking Up White, I'm woke, I'm hip. Because all of those folks, 
if we do not meet them with compassion, we're not bringing them along, right? And I want to say one more thing. Like, I see a sign back there that says prison is slavery. Amen. And I see a sign that says jail raises cops. But I want to invite you to think about the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. And so I invite you to think about what transformative justice looks like in this moment. And if the best we can imagine for police officers who lynch human beings is to put them in the cages that have become the new Jim Crow, can we do better than that? Can we think more broadly about what transformative justice will look like? Is it just throwing people in to houses of incarceration that are traumatizing and racist and hyper-masculine and toxic at their core? Is that going to make Derek Chauvin wake up one day and be accountable? No. That is not how we get accountability. So I would invite you to think about what in your life has allowed you to be accountable. When you have really caused harm, and everybody here has caused some emotional harm to somebody else, because if you're human, we hurt each other. We don't mean to, but we do. So I ask you to think about what allowed you to be accountable. And all I can tell you is in my own life, I have screwed up royally. I have caused a lot of harm. But what allows me to stand here and say that to myself and to you is that I can meet that part of me with compassion and understand why I lack the tools to do something better in the moment. And then when I know that I'm enough and I'm worthy and, I'm be and I belong, then I have enough strength in my body to say, yes, I'm complicit. And it's heartbreaking to know that I have blood on my hands and I'm going to do something about it. But I don't think any of us are going to do something about it if we spend our days beating ourselves up for being the oppressor, right? So I'm all for dismantling oppression and doing the work. I've just figured out for myself that if I don't start from a place of compassion, what we know about people when we point the finger and we call them idiots and we call them stupid for not wearing masks and we say, how come they, they can't think critically and how come they don't understand racism and what the hell's wrong with them? Think about the last time somebody put a finger in your face. Were you open to that? Or did you go, whoa, 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 I'm feeling threatened, so my prefrontal cortex is going offline and my fight, flight, or freeze is activated. So all I'm calling for here to the white folks, it's our job to work with other white people. People of color need to get to be with themselves. Just heal and be with themselves. We're off to do our work. So I would invite us to do our work by rooting it first in compassion for ourselves and our grief and stop calling ourselves fragile. We're tender. Everybody's tender. People of color are tender. My God, how could people of color not be tender? But we're tender too. And tender is not a pejorative term. Babies are tender, right? So if we can meet our tender places with tenderness and extend that tenderness to other people, I think we have a better shot at engaging the people who don't come to these marches and don't line up on Route 101 and the long work ahead, because the truth is, it's awesome we're here, but we are not enough. We are not enough. So we're not enough in terms of like, we're not, a, we're great, but obviously there's many more people we want to reach who are not going to come to this rally. So I'm just inviting you to start with that compassion, feel it in your belly for yourself, see if you can extend it to the people whose behavior, we absolutely want to hold their behavior, them accountable to their behavior, absolutely. And we want to hold ourselves accountable for our behavior. Just remember in your life what has allowed you to be accountable when you have made a mistake. And I can guarantee you that shame is not what builds accountability. Empathy builds accountability. So I invite us white people to have some empathy, first as counterintuitive as it sounds, for ourselves and our profound epigenetic grief. And then maybe from that place we can empathize with the people of color whose lives we might try to learn about but cannot know. So that's what I have to say, and thank you very much for listening.